Uh, hi there, this is Phil Sinborg from the Back Backgammon Learning Center, and I've got online with me my partner uh, and my mentor and teacher, Perry Gardner. Say hello, Perry. Good afternoon, Phil. I'm okay, so, Yes, and there's a picture on the screen of uh, uh, Masanori, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Ikikawa from Japan. Uh, his nickname is Othello, and if you played online, particularly on Grid Gavin, you'll know he's been one of the top players in the world online for many years. Uh, and the reason I say online is because he doesn't travel outside of Japan, but he's well known in Japan as one of the top players. And for the last several years, I think it's been about 12 years or more, he's been giving a quiz. He takes the 10 toughest problems, uh, generally check or play problems, that he, that he, he encounters, that he thinks are interesting, and he makes it into a quiz for the Japan Open. And the last three years I went to the Japan Open, I missed it this year, and I always took the quiz and always did horrible. And I didn't feel too bad because everybody else did too. I think the winner of the quiz, they had 46 people take the quiz last year, and the winner got only six right. This year, the winner got eight right. Several times Mochi has been the winner, but lately he's been running the uh, the tournament there, so he hasn't been competing, but I'm certain he would either be the winner or close to it. But it turns out that the winner every year is one of the very better players from Japan or elsewhere. The first couple of years they gave it, Hugh Scarniers was the winner. So it's a really great, tough quiz. And one of the other things that's so wonderful about the quiz is that the answers aren't tricky. These aren't trick questions. These are common kind of problems that you might see often. And the answer is clearly better, the best play is clearly better than the rest. So when I first took the quiz myself, I got a copy of it, and I take it every year, and when I saw how badly I did, I really was miffed at myself, and, and, and not only that, but after I saw the answer, I wasn't always sure how to get to the answer, so I immediately uh, do what I always do when I'm in trouble, is I call Perry, and first I blame him for not being a good enough teacher, or else I would have done better, and then I asked him, to help me, but Perry made a great suggestion. We've got a lot of students. Uh, we've had over three or 400 students over the years. We've got 20 teachers at the Back and Learning Center. We've got a lot of people that would be interested in hearing why these plays are right and taking this quiz. So for the benefit of our students and friends, and we'll probably post this publicly as well for the benefit of the entire Back and community, Perry's going to teach me and teach us the right play and why. So. Like I do with all my videos, I'm going to bring up the problem and give you a little bit of time, but not much, to come up with your answer. But you can have as much time if you, as you want, because this is a video that you can pause. In the lower left-hand corner, you can pause it. And by the way, if you're seeing this on Facebook, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a little box that will allow you to make the, the PowerPoint or the video full screen. So do that as well, and of course, turn up the volume. And again, at the end of the video, if you have any questions, you can email me at pjsimborg at gmail.com, and I'll see that you get a good answer, and we'll follow up. Now, we might not get to all 10 in this first video. We might have to do this in two parts, so bear with us if, that, if that's the case. So, uh, Perry, anything to add before we start? No, that's fine, Phil. I, I, I might add just one line of point which you hit upon and that is what's very impressive about this quiz is the difference in equity between the right play and the second play each one of these plays the difference is is very very big and th that's really one great reason why these why this is such a tough quiz a good quiz uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, let's get started. Here's problem number one. And again, uh, you have to look at the score because sometimes there's a score involved and sometimes it might not matter. Now, I always show the away score instead of the actual score because this is what we really need in back end. In this case, uh, red needs five points to win the match and uh, blue needs four points to win the match. The extreme gallon, which is what we're using, also shows the pip count. So it's going to help you a little bit there. Red's up by 19 pips. And also taking into account where the cube is. So with all that in mind, your, your, your question here is how should Red play a 5-2? Again, pause it if you need more time. But for the sake of keeping the video shorter, we're not going to pause too long. And Perry's going to get right into the explanation. Now, I want to tell you that I got almost all of these wrong. So I'm not embarrassed to say I had no clue 
what to do with this five two. I considered many plays, including the right play, and ended up making the wrong play. So, again, pause it if you need more time. I assume you've come up with your play by now. Terry, do you want me to show the answer? Yes. Okay. So the answer I have in the second one, and the answer is, uh, and I put it in the post plus, and no, no need to roll them out because it's clearly right. The answer is the play that's shown, uh, which is 13-11-8-3. If you made that play, give yourself a point. And again, if you can get six or eight points, you would probably be the winner of this quiz. So, uh, Terry, why is this the best play compared to uh, this play, for example? Well, to begin with, as you always point out, when you look at a problem, the first thing you want to do is look at the score and look at the ga gammon value. In this position, the value is elevated. Uh, it, it's, it's about three quarters of 0.74. So gammons do count for you quite a bit. For your opponent, the, the gammon value is about the same, but his gammons in, in this position obviously are going to be less than yours, a lot less. So what, what is your game plan here is the question. And it should be obvious to all that attacking is one possibility because you've got a three-point board with a, poss with a chance of making it four if you play the five to the three. And the other possibility is we're going to look at the race initially. And we saw that we did look at it. We saw it was 19 pips. So if you can... Uh, get your checkers around the board, you may not have to close out these checkers, uh, your opponent's checkers. You may be able, he, he may just anchor up, or you might be able to get by with, with closing four or five points and have them on the roof. So that's essentially the thoughts that most of us would have looking at the position. So uh -huh. now we, any questions on that, Phil? Uh, no, I, 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 the reason, I, I, by the way, I actually made this play thinking that I didn't, uh, I didn't want to uh, have lots that, uh, that uh, give him the double shot. That's what scared me about the right play. Let me show you the final. By the way, you click on oh, yeah, final. I, I, I wanna, the problem I have I, with this is at least, at least twice as many numbers to hit. Well, that's, 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 let me interrupt you, Phil. That, that's the point I, wa I want to discuss first. Uh, at first glance, as you pointed out, it looks like this position leaves twice as many numbers to hit. It, it, it actually gives, uh, what, 20, 23 or 24? Uh, let's see, 24 shots you have here. With this, with this, right? Three right. and six is five, one and two, one. So you have 24 shots this way uh, to hit this guy. And the other way, you've got 17 sixes and five, four is 19. So is there a justification for leaving five more shots? And the way, the way we should decide that, let's look at the initial play again, Phil, and let's see your opponent's role. Actually, all of these problems are, are going to be, the solutions are going to be clear when we look at what the opponent is going to be doing, particularly this one. So out of the 24 shots, Phil, what threes hit? Hit that lot. I can only think of one, six, three. All the other threes are going to make the, the anchor, aren't they? So oh, yeah. we, can, we, can we can deduct from the 24 those 10 threes that make the anchor. And that's one of the features of this play, the duplication of the threes. That, that's the key feature that you need to see over the board. 
the threes that hit and the threes that make the point, those are duplicated, and your opponent is certainly going to make that point, except when he rolls the six three, or or actually, uh, actually even double threes, he's going to make it because he's going to make an inner board point uh, and hold on to that twenty point. So. Um, that's that reduces the, those hits right from 24 to 14 and let, let's take a look actually um another play of another role that doesn't hit can you name it phil that could hit um can i name it let's see um well, we've talked about the three, so it has to be a six something. And exactly. Be, what six maybe one? A, a six two would make the bar point, but I still think he would rather hit the make his bar point. Six well, Phil, let, uh, let's, uh, here's what we should do then. Actually, uh, six six two. Um, actually, he. Let, let, let's look. Let's look at the dice distribution here. Oh, here I can actually. I can do the, this. I can make the move. Let's let's make the move and then look at dice distribution. Yeah, it's right. easier to do it that way. Right. So right. let's make this move and now put blue on roll and then look at how blue plays all, what roles blue has that he can roll. Well, well actually the You can see how he plays the six two by hitting the button. Okay. So I'll hit one I'll hit plus to begin with. So I was right. With a six two he's gonna make the bar instead that of That is right. And and there's another one too, Phil. Um <laughs> let's see. Uh, a six five he'll make this point, I think. Okay. Six five he'll make that he'll make the, the nine point. Yes. That's right. Okay, so so now we take away four more rolls that I thought we were gonna hit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You take away four more that are going to, going to hit, and the ones that that uh, make the three point or the five two mainly there are more threes. Those are, are going to be primed by by your eleven point. So you can see the strength of your play after your opponent's rolls, his good rolls, mm -hmm. so called good rolls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so of course, when he doesn't, when he doesn't hit, I've got a much stronger game this way than the other way. Because I've got exactly. the interior point mate. Exactly. When he doesn't hit, your game is so much stronger. That's the whole point of this, of, of, of why you would leave these so-called phantom 24 shots. Okay, well, if we, stop this, if we stop the video and the lesson right now, I've already learned a tremendously valuable lesson I hope everybody else watching has. When you're counting shots, it's not enough to just count the raw shots. You have to look at duplication, and you have to see if he's really going to hit with those numbers. Right. It's an incredible lesson that, that I should know. <laughs> and well, let's, I, let's I have, look at... I have an excuse. Let, I've only been playing 50 years. So, so let, let's gonna, spend you know. another moment and, and uh -huh. compare that to the other play, I mean. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to the original. I, I hit Control C, Control V, and now I can make the, the the other play that we're talking about. Right, your play. It's my play. Okay. Now, in in this that, play, actually, instead of just giving them good threes, you're giving them a good six too. A lot of good sixes. And then, if, if he hits you with a, with a six, you've got very little going. You've got three guys back and very little going against the, his blot on your two point. And th there, there are actually, there, is, there are 19 of those shots. And of those 19, um, I, d I don't think all of them hit either, but most of them do. Um, for what I don't think hits again is the same three. Well, a six three, right? That doesn't hit. But all the other sixes hit. So, again, well, I don't know. See, let's see how you play a six three. 
You're right. You yeah. need the outside point. Right. He can't exactly. afford. To, he can't afford to be in a hitting game when he's so onboarded like this. Exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. But all the other sixes hit, and and again, you you're not priming him at all. You're you're letting him get away. You're giving him a lot more numbers than you did before. That are good. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And by the way, when you do get hit here, at least you've got no blot in your inner board and the four-point board. So if you come in and hit back, you've got a big game. Well, that's, that, that's, the, other that's the strategy of, of playing an attacking game here. The, the four-point board gives you an opportunity to attack later and also makes it more difficult for him to avoid taking risks. Risks meaning blots out there. Uh, that that four-point is dangerous, and that lets you, gives you some advantage in, in the racing game. So you, your stronger board gives you some opportunities to race by splitting and leaving some blots that you normally wouldn't. Uh-huh. Okay, so that's that's about it for this one. Okay, I happen to know that almost everybody missed this one uh, in the twins. And we're not talking about beginners. We're talking about a lot of very, very fine players that played in the Japan Open. They, get, they draw some very good players from all over the world. And after you give this explanation, it's so darn clear what you should do. So I must not be the only one that, didn't, that doesn't think along those lines or didn't think properly along the lines that you just described. Um, so I, I, I think it's amazing that with all the books that we've all read and all the lessons we've all taken, that we would miss this when the explanation makes it so clear. And this is an important theme in backgammon, incidentally. It's not like it doesn't doesn't come up. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the duplication on shots and indirect duplication as well as direct duplication on shots and yeah. comparing I, that to the alternatives. Yeah, I've seen many plays I, where I show my students a play and he says, well, I, I'm really going to hate it if he hits me. And I, and I would say to them, I would love it if he hits me because if he, hit, if he rolls that number, he has something much better he can do. So he's probably not going to hit you if he's any good. So I'm able to see it in simple positions, but this is more complex where I just totally missed it. And now okay, I'm just not looking for it a lot more. Okay. Great, great lesson. Incredible lesson right there. Thank you, Terry. Number two. Okay, again, setting the stage, this is a money game, so we don't have to worry about the score. Again, the cube is on blue side and red to play double three. Pause the video if you need more time. And I'll wait a couple more seconds and again give you a chance to pause it and come back after you've decided on your play. Okay, now I'll show the answer. I mean, who doesn't make the bar point here? It looks so automatic to make the bar point. Well, wait a minute. Like you, you, can't you, you, you can't make the you're oh, you on the ball. Oh, I'm you sorry. have to come I, in. I, I forgot that. So you have to come in. That makes them, that's right. If it wasn't on the roof, it would be pretty easy. Yeah, I forgot right. to check it right here. A typical problem. I wouldn't forget this while I was playing. I know very clearly. So one has to come in. You've got three more. So the question is how to play the next three. Right. Okay. Let's take a look. And the right play is to play wide open. Leave lots of right. shots. And again, uh, I think most people would play more safely, play much more quietly. And uh, Perry, I'll leave it to you to explain. Okay, so again, the first thing we want to look at is, is uh, the kind of game. This is an unlimited game, and your opponent's got the cube uh, in, in this game. So we need to take that into account. And you've got a four-point board, he's got a terrible two-point board, and uh, the, the race here after you roll is fairly even after, after you count your roll. So how do you play this, and, and why is it right for you to leave, again, we're leaving 20, 20, what is it, 22 shots here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a one or a three or, or a one or a four or a three, one, 22 shots. 
on, on this side of the board. Mm -hmm. So th this is actually a similar theme to what you just mentioned, Phil. That is that the opponent can do everything on both sides of the board at the same time. Looking at, at this, this position here, he can't point on you or make an inner board point or make his bar point or e even some rolls that, that make his nine point um, without rolling uh, a double or, or some great number. I mean, he can't, he can't get away, rather. He can't get away and, and do, and uh, he can't hit you and not leave a, leave a shot, right? Because on this side, on the inside of the board, he's got four, you've got fours and sixes now to hit him with. So he's got to lift that block somehow. Um, and on, on this side of the board, if he hits you, um, he can't make a point. He can only lift that block unless he rolls a double of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's take a look at, at the dice distribution on, on, this, on this roll and look at the numbers that um can yeah let's put the checkers in can we look at the dice distribution and put the checkers in right i want i want to see the rolls actually the the detailed rolls oh okay i'm sorry uh, first roll right the first um, roll and and on four ply But the, the first, you, you didn't put it on details. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Uh, yep. Okay. And let, if we, could you move that screen just so, to the left so we can see the board? That's as far as I can, well, I can't, okay, I can't move it anymore. Now, can see, now we can see those, we, okay. see we, most can, of them. See, we can see most of them over there. Okay. Well, look, look, look what happens. Look at his very bad numbers here. In, in this position, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the two positions, right? And in both mm -hmm. positions, and I'll tell you what, Phil, in, in the other position, I don't know if your audience remembers what, how it ends up. Um, I think we should go back and take a look at it so everyone can pr appreciate the difference when we look at, at this, this position. The other position looks like this. Right. What, what's happened here is that <laughs> you, here you're leaving 11 aces, right, and um, sevens, 5, 2, and 4, 3. Uh, yes. Which is how many? Fifteen. Fifteen. But but if you play them all that way, you're gonna you're gonna leave a ton of returns on the nine point, right? So again, here the question is, what what is is the uh, Blue going to do is blue going to blue may very well need to stay on some of these rolls uh -huh. because he's got a hit out there. Yeah, um, and you're you're totally ignoring the numbers that that hit and point here because that's available to either play. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Now the the point is this: when when he when he um, when he makes it, let, let's say. He makes an inner board point um, on your head or not on your head. So what, what I'm saying is we're going to take a look at we're going to look at the at the expanse of his numbers, the range of his numbers. One thing that he can do is make make an inner board point on either play. The other thing he can do is hit on the outside on either play, and the third thing he can do is get away. So 
the, the first thing we're going to do is l let's let's compare what happens to to the numbers that don't get away now in other words the, the numbers that that leave this guy here where he makes it in a board point or or he hits with the um he might hit with the ace and then with with a three proceed to make the nine point instead of well let's go to the other play because he on, on this play he's going to make you he's going to make the five point Let, let's look at the other play because that's interesting all right let's take a look let me try something let me try something real quick first uh, that i like to do i look at the two plays and i highlight them both and i right click and hit nice distribution and now I can see both dice distribution the side by side for his next roll and how it hurts us. Well, let's put four ply on if you want to look at it that way. Ah, should do it with both though. Takes a little time. You're right. One ply doesn't. This is two ply. It starts with, and it isn't that accurate. But I don't know why average is at the bottom. Maybe you should be doing flat. No. No, no, no I, I use the, the, right, the one roll thing. Yeah. The, what are you showing now? Uh, what, this what show, are you showing? You're this showing, shows, you're showing our roll, which, which is wrong. You should be showing his upcoming roll. That's what the problem is. is. Isn't this his upcoming roll? No, this is our that. roll. It says dice 3-3. Three, three. Oh. oh, I see. Okay. So, what I want to do then is, you want me to take the original position to see what it looks like. Okay, exactly. Right, and, and put the dice distribution on there now. For him. For him. He's okay, on roll. So I have, okay, so I have to make the play. One. Right. Two, three, four, and put blue on roll, and then dice distribution. Right. And then hit four apply. Okay. Right. Okay. So he, he, here's my point, Phil. Point to the to the to his worst rolls, starting with the three two. Okay. Okay. Notice. Uh, on the three two, he, he he just lifts to the six point, right? Right. He plays nine six eight six. Okay. So now you've got twenty seven hitters aiming at your six point when he plays that. Now look at the other. Now just think about it the other way. Uh, with the same number, he's going to do the same thing. But you're only going to have, on the other play, you're only going to have twos and, and sevens to hit them with. Right? Mm -hmm. That's 12 and, uh, what, like 16. 12 and, and sevens of uh, four of those. So that's 16 versus 27. A huge difference on the, on the rolls that leave them there, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now let, let's let's look at at some of the other rolls. I can't see your I can't see the rolls right now on the on your dice distribution. Six two would be the next bad roll, and he, he makes the seven point. Six two, he makes the bar. So again, when he makes the bar, um, you've only got the you, you've got a more difficult time getting out the other way, right? And, all, and less shots at him, at least here you've got 27 numbers that hit and um, when, when it's more difficult for you to get out. Mm -hmm. Now, the, when, when he makes the 5-2, the, the 4 point, the same thing. So that there's real big equity when he can't leave. Now let's take a look at what happens when, when, he, can, when he can leave in this position. For example, let's let's take um, a number that that hits 
and and that seemingly let's let's look at his fours. Let's take a look at his fours. Four two. Right. Four two. So, four two. He leaves and continues. He leaves and continues. But look, look, look at the, look at the returns you have. You, you've got sixes and fours to hit, and you can make your five point. His five point rather with a five. So you've you've got a ton of returns, and you haven't put a man out of play. One of the main themes of this play, the advantages of this play over the other play, is that it's it's critically important to make your six point. Putting that that checker out of play now. Let, let's take let's take a look at at the other play again now. Putting that checker out of play since we're discussing that now. Okay. So I'll go back to the original. Right. Come in with one and put the checker out of play. Right. Now, with, with three checkers back the way they are now, um, away from the action, and the way your checkers are configured, even if you don't get hit on the mid right now, what's going to happen on, on the next roll? It's going to be more difficult for you to make that six point, right? The, the way you, you don't have distribution, good distribution. You're going to be able to make it a lot faster, hit or not hit, unless he double hits you with, with the checkers in the zone. And, and not all checkers are going to hit you. We're going to see some fours don't hit anyway, and some aces um, don't necessarily hit anyway, uh -huh. or, or hit badly, we'll see. So the point is that losing the checker plus your, di your ending distribution makes it much more difficult to make the six. Now, why is that so important? It's so important because you, you have ongoing, continuous jeopardy when you leave that open, even with him on the roof, as you, you have three, four, five, you've got seven checkers to bring home right now. With those seven checkers to bring home, he rates to get fly shots from you with that, with that point open. Once you make that point and, and uh, you hit him, or you, you can get ahead in the race somehow, You've got a great game, but this this position should mainly steer itself towards contact being the winning position, because looking at your board and his, you've got a lot of really great opportunities. So, so another way to say it is, is this is a play you make if you were afraid of contact, and you're really not afraid of contact when you've got a four point board and he's got a lousy two point board. You're right. So let's. Let's go back to the original one more time and, and look and see why um, he doesn't hit you on the, on the first play with some fours. For, how would you play 5-4, for example? For blue, you mean? For blue, right. Okay, let's give blue a 5-4. Uh, how would I play a 5-4? I would, I think I, oh, I would come out safe and make this point. I wouldn't exactly, hit. Exactly, exactly. So, so you, so that, it, this just demonstrates again what we said about the last problem. Every potential hit isn't a hit. Uh -huh. um, and, and by doing, by doing that, that's certainly not a good role for you. It's a good roll for him. He gets away, but he's going to get away with all fives and sixes anyway. So um, you can't avoid those, but at least here, what, what you've done is you've created an opportunity with four checkers to make your six point faster. And, and you still have, you've got a nine to hit him with. Um, um, and you're not out of the race. 
it, it, you're not out of the race, and and uh, he he still has three three checkers out of play on his two, which which makes it not so easy for him to come home, and any blots would be a a severe uh, danger for him to leave blots. So it's not that easy to rectify his position and to smooth it out from here. I got it. Uh, let me make uh, one quick observation. If you take the wrong play, this play, I know two players that would never make that play. Paul McGrill, who says he listens to the checkers and they tell you where they want to be, and this checker doesn't want to be here. That's putting it out of play. That's a very simplistic way to see that there's something very wrong with this play because McGrill and other really fine players know you don't want to throw checkers out of play. And that's even though by keeping it in play, you're seemingly taking some chances, it's still more in play. And the other player that hits me right away that would get this play right is David Wells. I played with David Wells for many years, and many people know he's, he's a very, very top time player and a great money player. When I ask David why he would make a play, he doesn't give me numbers and the explanation that you give me. Uh, he thinks about all those things, but basically he says it doesn't look pretty. I don't make plays that don't look pretty. I try to keep the board looking pretty. So basically what he and the girl are saying and what you're saying is play pure back in and keep the checkers in play and put them to good use. Even if there's some risk involved, uh, you're better off uh, than every time you throw a checker out of play. That's, that's a real play. Now, sometimes you have to. But this is a red flag that this play has real problems. Um, let's just take, I, I, I want to make, I want to emphasize another point I, I, I made, but I, I'd like to emphasize it by looking at the other play again. Okay. Okay. L when he, when, he, when he makes the five point here, other than double fours, look at all the returns that you have. You've got ones, twos, and fours returning over here. So let's say he rolls a four one. If he rolls a four one, you're saying? He makes the five point, um, or he makes, uh, makes the four um, point? Well, he can't, th th this is an illegal play. What you just he rolled a four and one, he would make that play. If he made up four, let, let's take a look at the dice distribution. Okay. Let's see. He plays a four and one. He makes the five point, just like I said. Okay. So when he makes the five point, let's look at the let's look at the returns that he ha that you have. Okay. You can come in with ones, threes, and fours. You can hit with ones, twos, and fours. So you've got about ten return shots off the top of my head. Right. I, I think I think you have fourteen return shots. Return shots, but you have a a lot more return shots than if you just had twos. Right. Yeah. Yeah, a lot I, I by the way, you're right. You're right. It is closer to 14 return shots. You're right. Right. So, so the the returns when when the guy makes a great play, and I mean, uh, you, you got a, you have a lot more returns this way. A lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that's yeah. the point I wanted to make. Even on on a on a great number, um, like the four one, you've got all of these returns, and he's so he's. One other number that that really interested me is how he would play double aces. Take a look at that. How would you play double aces here? Oh boy! Well, well put put this checker back in there. Put the checker on the roof back in there. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Um, everybody says it's best to make the five point, but hitting two here is is exciting also. Um, so, if we make the five point, again, we've got those 14 return shots, so I don't like that. If you make, if you hit on the 18 and you safety, that's fairly ugly and there's still 
there's still ones and threes to hit back here. If you hit twice, there's only 11 numbers. Uh, if you've got a big game, if he doesn't hit you. Um, so I'm tempted to hit twice, so let me take a look at it. If I play one here, I'm sorry, and put him on the bar, and play one here, now where's the other two if I hit twice? Oh my goodness, could it be right? <laughs> move those two and not leave a block against this board? Or would I... Well, I'm going to leave too many other blocks anyway, because even if I go safety here, I'm still leaving... I think I switch if I hit two. But I'm still not sure I hit two. I might just make the five point. I honestly don't know. I need either hitting okay. two by switching or making the five point. Well, uh, s switching is right. The five point is, is very close to right. So, um... Okay. That, that kind of surprised me also. You, you, you need to put... Oh, yeah, I, got, I got the checkers in the wrong spots. Yes. Okay. Okay. Plus. okay, so I had the top two points. I wasn't sure which was right. You had the top two, but but that that points out how strong your board is and how, um, how he wants to avoid getting hit at almost any cost. Oh, looks like the second play that's close is is, is, is hitting and making the bar point. Oh, yeah, and only hitting and making the bar point. Right. Yeah, that's only leaving right. ones and threes, only leaving ones and threes, which are both duplicated, to get hit back. Right, that's right. Yeah. That, that was really interesting. Right. right. Yeah. So, when okay. you're playing in a, and you're playing in a match, and a play like this comes up, there's no way in hell you're going to take this kind of time to do this analysis. You're going to no, have to find the right play much faster. Well, look, and, it, it, here's, here's a, the answer to that, Phil. If, if you look, look at the board strength of both players, that, that tells you something. That, that's a key feature of the position. So in this position, you want to minimize your blots, so you're going to look for plays that minimize your blots as blue without going through all the numbers. I got you. So after okay. we've done all this detailed study that you're taking us through now, that's going to help us recognize the patterns and the key concepts over the board so we can make them in a reasonable and come to them much more quickly and more reasonably. Yeah. That that was the goal <laughs> of uh, going through these two two problems with you. I got it. I got it. That's incredible. That's great. And I know that's true. And the reason I raised that question, I knew the answer. Uh, it, it was a loaded question because it's the question that I get from every student when I start going into detail on a problem. They're saying, wait a minute, do you have time for this? The point is, uh, if you're going to learn karate, you're going to do it in slow motion first and do it very, very slow and get the moves right so that you can do it very quickly when you need to. It's the same thing in backgammon. By, by getting the knowledge in the background that we're getting now from Perry, you will be able to see these concepts faster over the board. Okay, let's go to number three. Okay. All right, uh, setting the stage. Red is two away. Well, he needs two points to win, and his opponent is five away. He came this in the center, and Red has a 2-1 to play from the bar, which I'm not going to forget this time. A lot of different plays here. Pause it. Think about what you would do, because we're going to get right to business and get right to the answer very quickly. Okay, I got my play, even though I, I, because I looked at this before, but I see about four plays that I like. <laughs> Here's the answer. Make well, the eighth point and hit off the two. Right. And in, I would think I think a lot of people would come in with the two and make the four point, and a lot of people would simply hit this checker on this three point. Well, those and are the two, those are the two next two plays. Uh huh. It, it, one very um, important concept in attacking mode is 
to not allow your opponent to consolidate his position. Uh, that, that's a key swing and a key concept of, of attacking. Especially when, he has other blocks, especially when he has other blocks around the board. That's what you mean. Yes. Well, when he has a chance to consolidate here, let's let's um, let's do the second play, Phil. Just show show the five to four and and coming in on on the on that two. Now look, he here he's got a five to make your bar point or a six one to make it. Uh, I mean that's 13 numbers that that are a huge huge swing in this position. Now if he doesn't roll one of those, I mean he's got some good threes to to make a point, but the big big swing are the numbers are, are the are permitting him to anchor. That's what you're avoiding by hitting instead of making this point. You're not allowing to, um, him to anchor. E even if you anchor and pick up the other checker, he's still... Um, well, let, let, let him anchor. I mean... Well, first of all, I want to point something out. A lot of people are worried about getting hit here. But again, you're only going to get hit 11 times. So, uh, and he only comes in... 20 times. What about the 16 times he dances? It's real easy to see what a wonderful position you have when he dances. Well, that's, the, well, that's the big bonus here. Exactly. As you know, um, comparative board strength is a key to attacking strategy. You, you, you've got so much better board strength than he, he does. You've got a four-point board with builders for, for the fifth point. And he's got a, a, a blot on his inner board and nothing else. Uh, and he's got a blot on your midpoint, or your bar point, rather. So for all those reasons, the 16 dances and the opportunity to, to hit him, another thing that you, another good reason to hit him on the two, on the two point is you don't want to give him a chance to make that two point. That's why um, hitting him on the 22 is very bad because he can make that two and that gives him a very good game. Once he makes that, uh, when I say a very good game, um, he, the, he, he's, he's got like 26, 27% chances in that game. Uh, and plus the gammons, plus, plus his gammons get reduced tremendously, and you can win the match with a gammon here. Exactly, exactly right. Mm -hmm. So th th those are the reasons why you you want to hit him. Um, the, the other reason you mentioned, though, you, you talked about the twenty incoming numbers. Well, you know, th there's eleven that hit. Not all of them that hit make the three point so you've got another blot to go against and all the ones that come in on the four point also are not constructive for him for example how does he play a four one um or two your play right yeah four two four two well right four, they're not six, constructive four, six, they're, all, they're all bad all, all bad 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 numbers for him as you point out too yeah. All bad numbers for him. So that, that's why this play uh, is clearly right. Yeah. I got it. Which one I can see very easily. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Number four. Setting the stage, it is a money game, a limited game. You in the center. Red again on the bar to play a 3-1. Obviously, he can come in hitting on the 1, or he can come in on the 3 and move a 1 someplace else. So, see, there are two choices. you got to come in on the 1 with the 1 or the 3. Pause the video, take the time, come back. 
Welcome back. Here's the answer. And the answer is wrong. <laughs> that's a wrong. No, it's a wrong uh, position. I mean, plus plus instead. Okay. Okay. The answer is to not hit. And go all the way up and not hit and not clean up the blot either. I got this one wrong. Okay. Well, this really is is a question of uh, strategy. What 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 game plan is best for you here? Um, you, in in one variation, you're 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 certainly trying to prime them, and you're trying to hold this checker back on 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 the twenty. You're trying to prime that that checker on the twenty. So by however you end up, either either way, whether you hit or not, that that's a goal. Now, if you hit, you 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 want to try to contain both checkers. That that's that's your goal. If you hit, um, if you if you don't hit, um, how does that help you? Con how does that help you? Period. By not hitting. After all, you're 45 fifths back in the race. Well, hitting doesn't bring you back into the race, right? The hit hitting is only gives you 24 pips, but it doesn't get you back in the race. But it's easy to think that that second checker back makes it easier to prime the checker that's on the 20, but it turns out not to be the case. The, the second checker back actually makes it more difficult to prime the two checkers. It's easier to prime the one at this stage. And why is that? Because we can enter with two checkers. The, the 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 reason is well right off the bat, all his fives disrupt your prime, right? Either either he's going to make it or he's going to hit, and um, so uh, it, 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 either way, it's not going to be good for you. If he makes it, you've got the two checkers out of play, and um, he's got control of the outfield. And it, it, it looks likely that you're going to have to move the che you're going to have to move the prime forward w without the five point, right? He, um, when he makes the five, you know, four, one, three, two, when he makes it or when he hits you. The, the other part of this equation is. Compare that to when you don't get it. Well, let's take let's take a look at a few of the other numbers. When he comes in and he doesn't hit you, let's say he comes in with a three one or something, and he comes up to your twenty one point. Now, it it what are you going to do now? You, when you when you make let's bring him in. You want to show that position? Well, we hit and come up. And You're hitting and coming up. And now, right, and bring him in on the on the twenty one point. Now, um, when you hit him, other if you don't roll a double, you're going to leave blots. You're going to have to disentangle your prime, disarm your prime to hit him, and or point on him, and he's going to make one. He he rates to make one of the others or get away. Right, he, you've got. You've got yeah, two. You're stripped. You're stripped of the outfield. The That's it. The, these points are stripped, and and one one that you are on this point, you've only got one blot. Uh -huh. So it it makes it more difficult to prime him this way. With the okay, second check of that. Let's talk a second about what's wrong with my play. We haven't talked about my play yet, and it's also the point that several of my students made that I talked to about this. I hit twice. Most of us, our tendency would be to hit twice, which is the fourth best play, I know. But hitting twice looks like it prevents a lot of the things you're talking about. Why is this so bad? Let me okay, take a look. Like. Let's take a look at. Let 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 let's take a look at, at this play. The 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 problem with this play is that you you're gonna you've got one two three. Three blots out here to clean up, 
and you've got all of these guys, you've got four guys back already, right? So mm -hmm. you've got the, the, the 11, 11 fives, right? Right. That hit a guy. You've got four, four is 12, right? Uh, right. And what, you've got 16 numbers that come in on these points. It's very difficult, very, very difficult when you have four points open and one slotted to prime these two checkers, particularly avoiding getting another guy back. Um, and these four guys are essentially out of play. I mean, it's very difficult to come out and work on your inner board, right? You want you want both roles to, to work on your inner board, if possible. So we only have 11 checkers. We have 11 checkers to work with, and there's some redundancy with the stack here. Exactly. The redundancy with the stack and with all of these these uh, points open. The, the other thing about that's nice about this, the, the comparing the plays, when you when you don't hit him on the ace point, th this is a, a later vulnerability for him. Um, th there are variations where you can hit him later on the ace because he doesn't cover it. And the other thing is um, you, you're free to attack with more gusto on this side of the board because you can make his four point more easily and and some aces go, are going to make it so w when you do get more checkers back you, you can you can go into a back game more easily that's the point so one of the immediate fears you have is that he's going to roll a five and hit this checker and it wouldn't we hope he doesn't roll a five but if he does at least you can possibly 11 times hit him here and still can pay him. well you got the 11 to hit him here and and then you have uh all, all, all fours, right? Or make, make this point. point. Uh, once you make this point, um, your checker, your your uh, racing count is going to give you a, a decent four, three, four back game, right? Uh, with, with another checker from another checker back, you, you've got a decent timing for this game. I, th I think that's essentially why uh, it's right not to hit. Those are the main I reasons. It. I got it. I got it. And this is one that I'm sure most people miss. Uh, it's a toughie. And again, I, I did discuss this with, uh, with a few of my students, and every single one of them hit twice. <laughs> so I, I can see that, that tendency to do that. Uh, but now I see why it's so bad. I can by comparing it. By the way, this is another really an interesting uh, observation about backgammon. There is no good play or bad play. There's only better or worse than the alternatives. Hitting twice is often a very, very good play. It might be a very good play in a position very similar to this, but you have an alternative that's better. So you always you can't just look at a play in isolation. Anybody who doesn't look at all the plays and compare them is not necessarily it, it has a good chance of missing the right play. Oh, right. The, the key issue here with the hitting really is is where where your checkers are positioned on the other side of the board. All uh, right. Th this where you you need so many sixes to come out, um, and then you you worry, and and then you're go you're going to be hitting loose in here. So let's see. Let's see if you have your checkers at the edge of the prime. If hitting twice now becomes better. Let's test that theory. It should be more now. It, it does change the game. You don't hit. You still don't hit twice, but it does change the change the idea. Now you're hitting up here because you can come out here. Well, you and can maintain your prime here. That's the whole point. Yeah, you don't have you to give up an asset. Time. This is a, uh -huh. the eight points an asset for you, and right. you're, you're you're giving you're giving that asset up. You may not be able to get it back. Mm -hmm. But again, this does prove your point that being up at the edge of the four prime is a much stronger position for a red than being than being back. That's so true. Yeah. Very good. All right, let's go to the let's go to number five, five. and we're gonna
this will be our last one for part okay. one, and we'll do the other five in part two. Okay. Because okay. I don't want to... People don't want to spend too many hours at once looking at the it. videos. They got to. They got to go to dinner. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Number five. Uh, again, uh, we have a score five away, seven away, which isn't a real, real drastic score. It's not a whole lot different from money, I don't think. Uh, and the cube is in the center, and red to play six three. So give it a little thought. Pause the video. Okay, I'm going to go right to the answer. Again, pause the video if you don't want to see it yet. The right play is to come out partway and stop, and I'm willing to bet that the majority of the players either play this play and go all the way, or play this play and get perfectly safe. Again, obviously what's wrong with this play is the McGrill theory about putting the checkers where they want to be and putting them out of play. Uh, but... Comparing this play to this play is really what I'm interested in, Perry. Well, uh, at, at least at least uh, you, you, uh, you got the six right when when you do this. the 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 point the point here is that um, it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get this other checker home. And here, when you don't get hit, look at the numbers that don't hit that don't hit you. I mean, some of the numbers are going to point on you, and you got some returns. Remember, you're going to have some returns now, um, some fours that that hit this guy. And if you get pointed on, and he uses these builders, you've got some returns on the inside. Uh, but if he doesn't roll, a, and when he rolls a four, th this checker more likely, most likely, isn't safety. So that's that's one one consideration. The biggest consideration, and the reason for it, of course, is that you're in communication. Your your way. What what is the race over here? The race is is fairly close, right? And and you're running out of time. The other play, you're stripped. Uh, shortly, you're going to be stripped shortly. You're going to be coming in, right? You're going to be coming in. He's going to be out here. Uh, you, you've got to, you've got to get away. He, th this gives you a real opportunity to make this point. Now, the, if, if he hits you here, for example, if he hits you with a, with a three, one, right? You've got sixes back and, and five. Five four back. Uh, if he hits you with a with a with a four six, you've got numbers back. So well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But Barry, if he hits you with a three one, you also can hit the checker on the nine point with a one four two four and a three four. Exactly. exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. And this doesn't leave that many more shots than than this. Uh, and while it does, while it does leave a couple more shots, there are many fewer return shots if he hits you here than if he hits you here. Well, so the I whole point, the return shots is the key also. And I like what you said about communication. What I want to define that real quick. Uh, by communication, he means these checkers are within one roll of each other. They're within six of each other. So on the next roll, it's possible for Red to make this point. And by also communication, if this gets hit loose, that means it's possible for Red to hit this checker with a one six, two six, three six, or five six. That's a lot of rolls. Right. Well, the whole point is, that that you just made is key. You're gonna you're leaving a blot. You're leaving a blot, right? Uh, yeah. When you come all the way, right? You're leaving a blot. So uh, you're, you're yeah. leaving a, a twelve shot here, right? Where, whereas right. here, you're leaving some more numbers, undoubtedly, right? You're, you're leaving some more numbers, but you've got returns. Plus, you've got the opportunity to make this and co come out, so you have a better chance in this race. That, that's the whole got deal. It. Got it. Makes sense. Now, if you were 
far as it be high in the race, you, you might not consider this play. You might not break your anchor because uh, you wouldn't even consider racing. But this race is, like you said, close, and race might be your best opportunity. But there's one other thing you didn't mention that also uh, makes me like this play, and that's we have them outboarded. So that if we do get into a hitting exchange, I like having four interboard points where my opponent has two. That tells me I shouldn't be as afraid of contact as you would be if you made the chicken play, where you're more afraid of contact. Uh, this is a play... This is a position that tells you, just like that first position, don't be that afraid of contact when you have them outboarded on the inner board. You, you couldn't be more right, Phil. That, that, that's an absolutely key component of this position, the strength of your board. That, 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 that you, you need to use that strength of your board earlier rather than later. Because okay, later, wanna, this board is going to be stronger. More than I want to end this session. I want to end this session with my favorite saying: "You don't know what you don't know." And you can play this game, and I know people who have played this game, including myself, for 20 years or more, and had no clue about a lot of the things that Perry is talking about. And there's, of course, many, many other subjects we haven't even touched on, like uh, about the doubling cube. We've just been talking about checker play. And how do you find these things out? You don't find them out by playing. You don't find them out by watching. And even if you do notice something by watching a great player, uh, you or, or you see that XG does something, you won't remember it because you haven't really learned the concept. If you really want to learn this game, you need to study. You need to read books or take lessons. And by the way, we're strong believers in taking and giving lessons because we do that for a living. And we have many of us, we have 20 of the best teachers in the world. So check us out at uh, com or com, and you'll see the, uh, the uh, incredible teachers that we have and look at our testimonials and you'll see how many people have learned uh, just about everything I've learned I've learned from Perry and Stick and John and, and Paul McGrill and many of our other teachers and I'm passing it on and a few things of my own but this is how you learn uh, this is how you learn what you don't know and how to apply it over the board uh, we will have a part two in the near future, or by the time you see this posted, you probably will see part two posted as well, and we'll do the last five problems. And by the way, the last five problems will go faster because they are simpler, and we've already covered a lot of the issues that, uh, that Perry's going to refer to in the next five. Perry, thank you very, very much for this lesson, and uh, I will see you very shortly when we do the next five. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Phil.